In this video, I'm just going to briefly go over laboratories one and two for Chem 120. Those are the week one labs. So we're talking about scientific measurement, and we're also talking about um, metric measurement. Okay, so in the lab one, using the scientific method, a lot of students kind of struggle with this because it's taking these abstract ideas of following observation, hypothesis, experiment results, and theory and actually designing a physical experiment for that. Um, so really what you want to do is you want to read through the entire lab first and then um, think about the pre-lab. So let's talk about um, the, per the principles of experimental design. So for example, in um, exploration one, what we're doing is we're exploring the, the effect of physical medium And what that means, if you read through, is that we're going to be looking at solid versus liquid on the rate of diffusion. Okay, so whenever you see the word rate, what you're probably thinking is like this is some like unit per time. So like a really kind of easy way to think about rate, like a rate could be like miles per hour, it could be centimeters per second, it's something about that, but a rate always means it's some unit that we're measuring per time. So we need to be asking ourselves, how do we measure? What are we measuring here? And that's really going to help guide you to making a really great experiment because as we know with the scientific method everything has to be measurable we can't just guess we want to put a quantitative measurement onto something so in this we are given a list of materials um, and several graphs graphing paper and stuff on and and things of that ilk so um, and if you're kind of like looking through the lab, it's like uh, in table one, it kind of gives you like a time, time in minutes. So we're going to measure something according to table one at zero minutes, and that's initial, and then at five, 10, and 15 minutes. And if we look a little bit further, um, this table recommends looking at the diameter of red 40. So really what we're doing is we're taking a physical medium, so this is going to be our agar plate, that's solid, and then we're going to take um, a petri plate of the same and maybe put some liquid in there. And the goal is to see if the diffusion rate changes. So we probably have to look up a little bit about diffusion. What diffusion really tells us, um, that's like movements of molecules from a very, very high concentration. Over time, they will eventually become spread out. Right, and this takes no energy and it's a naturally occurring process, so we call that spontaneous. Um, so that's our idea of diffusion, and this happens in our cells. We diffuse wastes out. This is how chemicals move from one place to another, and that's because each molecule is moving a small amount, and as they hit each other, it spreads everything out. That's really, that's really happen, happening over time. So in this experiment, we wanna see, is this gonna happen faster, because we're looking at rate, if it's solid, and so remember, solid is like keeping everything closely contained. Everything that's a solid is very rigid, like a cube, um, with everything very structured inside of that cube, right? So I just think of it as like, you know, cells, you know, like a cage. Like everything's very rigid, it has, everything's very tightly bound together. Whereas a liquid, the connections are a little bit looser. So which one do you think is going to diffuse faster? How is this 
having a solid medium versus a liquid medium going to affect the rate. So that's going to be our hypothesis, and this is our observation. Um, so we can think about this in terms of like intravenous applications of medicine. If we put a medicine directly into blood, like IV directly into our bloodstream, is that going to be, oh, I totally did that funny. That's okay. Um, is that going to be quicker to getting that medicine through the body? Or maybe if we inject it in, straight into our muscle, our muscles are solid. Will that go th straight through, through the body? Which one's going to be faster? Which one's going to be slower? Which is better for the patient? Okay, so that's kind of like an application we can think of. So one of the things that we can do is we can take an amount of red 40, which is just a food dye. It's found in um, Gatorade, basically. And we can put a little bit of red 40 in each. And then over time, we can see this spread. So it gets, it's going to get a little bit bigger and 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 a little bit bigger. And so what we can do to see is we can measure the diameter, the diameter of the spread. So when we started, it was here. And so that's going to be our time zero point. This is when we first add it. And we can measure this diameter over 15 total minutes in both the solid and the liquid, and we would expect um, one of these to be faster than the other. So it's one of the things we can do using a ruler, some, an agar plate and liquid plate and stuff like that. So we can fill out that table. And then in order to really answer this question, uh, we could graph our result. And so maybe one of these is going to be steeper with, of course, anytime you're graphing an array, on a rate, you want time on the bottom. So in this case, we're going to have minutes. And then if we're measuring diameter, we're going to have diameter here on the side. And whatever unit we have for there. So maybe it's centimeters, maybe it's inches, maybe it's millimeters. You know, it, that depends on the experiment. And so the most important thing for graphing is to make sure that your axes are even. It's not going to be like 0, 15, 16, 37, 54. That is absolutely terrible because this that's saying this gap is 15, the same gap is 1, the same gap is 17. That's, that's nuts. Don't do that. That is absolutely horrible. That's a huge misrepresentation of the data. So we want to make these probably even. So probably if we're measuring every five, we're starting at zero. This is going to be our first point. This is going to be the initial spread. And then maybe like five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And see how this gap is five minutes, and this gap is five minutes, and this get all the gaps are even. That absolutely has to happen. If your gaps are not even, you are not plotting it correctly. And then the same thing with the diameter. So you can, after you've collected all of your data, you can maybe look and see what numbers would be appropriate here, making the spread even. And of course, you can make it nicer with you know graph paper or rulers. I'm just freehanding this. So maybe we'll just say one, two, three, four, five, six. You know whatever units those are. And then to plot this, um, so at the time point one, maybe it was 0.4. At time point five, it was like 1.3. You know, so you, you plot it all the way out. And then maybe our other one, it started, maybe it started at one. And then at five minutes, it was at the same. 10 was here. And so sometimes you might put a little bit extra. Maybe it spread a little bit sooner. But what we really want to... So, so the numbers can be misleading until you graphically represent them on a chart. So that's really why it's important to do a chart. Um, and then just plotting your y-axis as diameter and your time is on your x-axis, which is this axis here. Okay, and then you want to look at the slopes. So the slopes, those are your change it's it you know it's the rise over run so it's a change in the y value over the change in the x values right on average and basically what that tells you is if it's steeper up then that's going to be faster 
and if it's more horizontal then it's going to be slower so just graphically looking at it you can tell that even though they started at slightly different points that this blue line which maybe this blue line was the solid I don't know maybe it's the liquid I'm just randomly labeling these you're going to actually look at your results and make a nice plot um, so we have lo a lovely key here and then from this we would conclude that the solid is the faster one and the liquid was the slower rate so this is just one example of a lab that you can do um, a question that you can ask and a relevance and then in the the rest of the lab all of this is like kind of just designing your own experiment just to get used to that idea um, and there's several variables that we're going to minimize in there and you know we could talk about that more in lab in exploration two, you do the exact same thing, looking at how temperature affects diffusion. So we're going to look at this with hot water, with room temp, um, temp water with uh, cold water, and then we want to make sure that uh, we're putting these into beakers of the same size. Look at my beautiful beakers. And we want to make sure that the volumes are the same because if one, if you take like um, sugar and you put it into a small amount of water, it may seem like it's not diffusing, not dissolving. Um, but if you put in a big amount of water, it might seem like it's dissolving faster because there's more places for it to go. So we want to make sure all of our volumes are the same. That is not a control that is a variable. So we're keeping that variable the same throughout. Um, and then like a thermometer to measure the temperature because we want to be able to show that this one is indeed hot. Like if the difference is like five degrees or one degree, maybe that's gonna make a difference. We're gonna put thermometers in each. Then we're gonna take our red 40 and pop it the same amount into each. Again, that's not a control, that's a variable. And then we can see how quickly it's going to spread throughout. So, this one I think is a really kind of good one to kind of talk about controls. Uh, because one of the things, how can you tell if it's completely spread? Well, you can take a drop of dye and just wiggle it, right? That's how we can see if it's completely spread. Um, just completely stir it around and that could be your positive control and that's how you can tell that this has gone to completion. A good negative control for this would be no dye, right? So this is kind of like what the starting line looks like. And this is kind of what the finish line looks like. So that's another way to think about kind of positive and negative controls. And so you could also think of that uh, for the first one, what can you do um, to, to see what does nothing look like? Where's the starting line? And then what does the finish line look like? Uh, what would it look like if it was 100% diffused? And that would be um, the diameter of the entire plate, for example. You could do, there's several controls you can think of. There's not just one control. And then you'll perform that experiment. Okay, so in both of these, it's going to be really, really important to perform a peer review. And what that means is you're going to talk to the other tables about their experiments and their conclusions and see if everybody got the same patterns. Because in science, that's a really important kind of final step is you disseminate your findings to the scientific community. And if it's predictive and it's been done several times, uh, then we can call that a theory. So after you have your results, we're going to do a peer review and make sure that you do that before you leave. Um, that's going to affect your questions on page six of the lab. And I think that's it. You know, just talking about why peer review is important.
And that at the very, very end of lab one, you're going to write your reflection. That reflection, I do expect it to be about 10 to 14 sentences, uh, talking about what you learned. Some of the learning objectives could be good for that and give specific examples. Okay, and so the pre-lab is also related to that lab one. I expect you to have uh, an experiment designed for this first lab before you come in. Okay, so in lab two, that's metric measurement. In this lab, it's really the goal is kind of uh, to look at the glassware, get yourself familiar, familiarized with um, with the different limitations of the glassware. And I will say this, the number of lines, which are called graduations, really does matter. And that's gonna be important when you go to take your skills test or when, and when you're doing labs later on. Typically the rule is if there are more lines, it is more precise and more accurate. So in exploration one here, you're gonna be looking at volume measurements. And so you're gonna take um, some beakers uh, of different sizes and the specific sizes that it states in the lab report are not 100% essential. Really what you need is um, just some, some different size speakers. You need um, approximately, you, you, we need three of the same size speaker and then one of another size speaker. And it doesn't matter what the size is. And then um, one of another size speaker. So what in this one, what you're gonna be doing is here's my beakers. Beakers have like a couple lines on them. other beaker. You can use the 100 mil beaker for this one. Okay, and what you're going to do, you're going to take a beaker, you are going to take a syringe. I'm changing that part because syringes are more fun. And you are going to take a graduated cylinder. Cylinder looks like this and has lots of lines on it. Okay, and for each one of these, you are going to measure, let me see, what's the volume we are measuring? We are measuring 10 mils. 10 mils of water using a beaker, using um, a, a syringe, so beaker, syringe and a graduated cylinder and then you're going to so put you're going to put 10 mils in here you're going to put 10 mils in here you're going to put 10 mils in here and when you're measuring this what you want to keep in mind is that for each of these you want to find that 10 mil line and then that liquid the bottom of the meniscus has to line up with the bottom of that line so water has this property where it kind of climbs up and it makes these little curves. So the bottom of this line has to line up with the, with this line right here. So you want to make sure that the this is called the meniscus. The bottom of the meniscus lines up with that graduation for whatever the 10 mil is. And if you don't have a specific line for the 10 mil, then you need to eyeball it. Yes, eyeball it. Because the purpose of here is not to measure 10 mils exactly, um, but it's to see how accurate each one of these are. So we're gonna take these containers that have been pre-weighed, and then you've marked your weights for each one of these beakers that have been labeled into your lovely little table. So that's gonna be the initial mass of the labeled beaker, that's step five. So we've pre-weighed those, we've recorded that in table one. Then you're going to take this liquid and dump it in here. You are not going to use anything else to transfer this. The liquid is coming straight from this measuring device that you've measured to 10 milliliters straight into here. Then you're going to weigh it again. 
So that initial, the initial pre-weight, that was just the weight of the beaker for each one of these. So we're going to take our beaker weight, our beaker mass, and we're going to subtract the mass of the, the total beaker, beaker plus water, at, which is after we've added that 10 mils of water in there. And what we're going to end up with is the mass of just the water in table one. So it's going to be, this is our total mass because when you pop this onto the scale, you are measuring the beaker and you are also measuring the water, that's our total mass. And then if we subtract out the mass of that beaker, then all that we're left with is the mass of the water. Okay, and then we're going to use, um, you're going to have to take the temperature of the water on the day. And so from the temperature of the water, uh, we can look up the density of the water. on a chart because it's not something that we necessarily uh, memorize. For most intensive purposes, it's going to be about one gram per milliliter, but there's going to be a whole bunch of decimals to make this really accurate, very, very, very precise. Okay, and then we are going to calculate the expected mass of water from the density because we know that density is going to be the mass over the volume. Okay, so this density that we got from the temperature is going to go right here. We know the volume because that's how much we we weighed out, it's supposed to be 10, right? So we can solve for the mass by rearranging so whatever the temperature is that's going to tell us what the density is we're going to multiply that by the volume if we measured it perfectly and that's going to give us the expected mass, which will be in grams, okay? And that's going to go in table one. So that density is here, it's whatever we look up during lab. Here's the volume, and that's going to give us our expected mass, and yes, the expected mass of 10 mils of water will, should be the same if you measure it with a beaker, with um, a syringe, or with a graduated cylinder. So all those expected masses will be the same. Then we are going to find the difference between the expected mass which we've calculated minus the actual mass which is this and that's going to give you the difference and the measuring device with the least difference is going to be the best measuring device. So that's why it's really, really, really important to use these specific, the beaker, the syringe, and the graduated cylinders for the measurement. A lot of students try to use the graduated cylinder and then just suck it up with the syringe, or use the graduated cylinder and then pour it into this beaker and then pour it into that beaker. That's not the point. We want to see which one of these measuring devices is the most accurate which one's going to be the one that we should use to make really precise measurements going forward. And so make sure that you're paying attention and following this direction step by step. And if you get confused, which is absolutely normal, you go ahead and ask your questions. In exploration number two, that's measuring the density of an object. What you're going to do is you're going to get a graduated cylinder and you're, we're going to be um, measuring this, measuring the volume by displacement. Um, so you're going to have like a certain amount of liquid in there. You're going to get some object, maybe a square. You're going to add it in. And then from this initial, here's the initial reading. And then after we add in the object, 
the volume's going to go up because that object has displaced, displaced some of that liquid. And then you're going to get the final reading. And it's going to be, so final reading here, maybe the initial reading here. So it's going to be, let me change the thickness on that. It's going to be final reading minus the initial reading is going to give you the volume of the object. And then, in order to calculate density, that's only one piece, we also need the mass over the volume. So you're going to also take that object that's completely clean, clean and dry, and you're going to measure this on the scale. And the volume you're going to measure with the graduated cylinder. Um, and then you're going to calculate the density, making sure that the units are grams per milliliter, which is the same thing as grams per uh, centimeter cubed, etc., etc. Okay. And then in exploration number three, that's your practice with dimensional analysis. Okay, and so what I want to caution you is I want you to look for these words. And these words are going to mean that it's a conversion factor and when it's a conversion factor you're going to use it in a fraction per oops for every does not start with a p for every in each and it could also be like in every or for each or something like that and also, what you want to do, the way that I always start these, and it's not necessarily the way that you have to start it, but this is the way I always do it. We, if you are given many, many things, start with the non-conversion factor. Right, so if you're given something like um, this many teaspoons per doses, but you know that there's uh, a volume of this. Start with the volume. I know you're give, also given teaspoons, teaspoons per dose, but and just because it's given first doesn't mean that you necessarily have to start with that. So I always start with the non-conversion factor because for me that's easiest. And you always want to make sure, sure that your units cancel top to bottom. like that, um, which maybe that's a bad example because they have to be exactly the same to cancel, right? Um, so your units are canceling like that and the units that you want end up on top. They have to end up on the top of this ladder. If they end up on the bottom of the ladder, then go back and um, flip the entire ladder. Right? You would have to um, end up writing it like this. All right, so you could just literally flip it, should you need to. Start the problem over, should you need to. Um, and feel free to look up conversion factors. There's several resources on Canvas. Um, and there's also some on Google, and if you're not sure, you can reach out to me uh, for additional resources with that. Okay, and so that's the expectation for the week one labs, and I hope that this has been helpful.